Welcome back to the book club. I'm Michael Knowles. And for this episode, we are going to do something we've never done on the book club before. We are going to pry open a science textbook, but it's, it's much less dry than it sounds. This is a very old school science textbook. It's not even really a textbook. It's a dialogue concerning the two chief world systems by Galileo. But first, in our fast-paced world, it is tough to make reading a priority, especially when the books are this long. It's very difficult. At least it used to be. At thinker.org, they summarize the key ideas from new and noteworthy nonfiction, giving you access to an entire library of great books in bite-sized form. You can read or listen to hundreds of titles in a matter of minutes, from old classics like Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People, to recent bestsellers like Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life. If you want to challenge your preconceptions, if you want to expand your horizons, if you want to sound very, very smart at cocktail parties, go to thinker.org. That is T-H-I-N-K-R.org. No E. No time for that. Start a free trial and put your mind in motion. We are going to put our minds in motion talking about the motion of the solar system, the motion of the universe, and we will do that with an actual scientist. My guest, Brian Keating, the Chancellor Distinguished Professor of Physics at UC San Diego and the author of Losing the Nobel Prize. Brian, thank you for being here. It's a great pleasure to be here, Michael. And Brian, I also have to thank you. You brought me presents. I did. When you, you're the first guest to bring me presents, including a piece of the moon. Yes. You brought me somehow a piece. I don't even know. Did you did you hitch a ride with Richard Branson or something? I don't know this how to. This was delivered the old-fashioned way by the United States Postal Service. <laughs> <laughs> That's so great. You can get your own, very own uh, samples of the moon if yeah. you were an astronaut. That uh -huh. would be one way to get it, yeah. expensive way to get it. Or you can actually get them online. There are actually sources of getting slices of the moon. And this is actually apropos of this book because the moon figures greatly in the dialogue concerning the two chief world systems. And it sort of uh, provides a foil to some of the arguments against that of the protagonist, really portraying Galileo himself, this character yeah. Salviati. But uh, I thought it'd be good to just su maybe summarize what this book is and, and, and how it had an effect on me as a young scientist and even greater effect as a more mature scientist. Yes, I think that's a good idea because I think there might be one or two people out there who didn't get to finish the whole book, <laughs> maybe at tops three. That's right. So, yeah, could you just very briefly describe how the book is uh, designed and who the characters are and why... Galileo got thrown into prison. Well, we'll get into that too. Yeah, that's we'll a little misunderstood right. too. So it's it's an extremely important book in the history of science for many different reasons. Uh, one of which is that it's really laying out the scientific method for the first time to a popular audience. This book was written not in Latin, which was the conversant language for scientists of the day, the only language that Galileo was permitted to write in. He wasn't allowed to teach in Italian because that would be communicating to the mass public and the Catholic Church wasn't ready for that in the early 1600s. Yeah. He was prohibited via a Vatican injunction to do so. So, but in this book, he writes for a popular audience and it's really perhaps the first and might be the best example of popular science writing. It has no equations of note. Uh, so it's not a textbook like you would encounter when you come back and get your PhD someday, yeah. uh, perhaps in San Diego. Uh, it has no equations, no yeah. formula, nothing complicated. It presents some data. Uh, but, but the beautiful thing about this book is that it's literature. It's a work of yeah. literature. Uh, masquerading as a book about the way the world or really the universe could be arranged. And that is really the distinction that set into motion the scientific revolution, which we now kind of take for granted in our technological age. But if you ever stop and think about it, how do you really know that the earth goes around the sun? It doesn't appear that way. Right. Things would be different according to our natural notions of how motion and, and mass and other things work. So Galileo was responding to that, the perception that we feel like the Earth is stationary, and it appears as if the sun and the stars are orbiting around us. Yeah. You know, some more than others here in Hollywood, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. All uh, <laughs> orbiting around each and every That's one right. of us. It, well, you make this point on the textbook. Most science textbooks I've read do not have characters. Yes. They do not have a storyline. They do not take... So the, the book is divided into four days of these conversations, and there are three principal characters. That's right. So the first character is a, sort of an interlocutor to, mm -hmm. the, whose job is really to kind of translate between the two other protagonists in the story, one by the name of Salviati, the, uh, and he really has the words of Galileo. These were all three real uh, existing human beings that existed that Galileo knew, two of whom, Salviati and Segredo, had passed away decades earlier yeah. when Galileo wrote this in 1632 when it was published. Um, but there were uh, true people. 
the third person uh, by the name of Simplicio, yes. aka the simpleton, uh -huh. he's you know considered by Galileo. Galileo describes him sort of like an amalgam of a, maybe a sixth century you know a scientist and a and, commentator and, on Aristotle. Right. And so far down, you say you've got Sal Salviati. He's yep. the one, and there are two other characters we should mention: Copernicus, yes. who's saying that the Earth revolves around the sun, correct, and Ptolemy, the older view. Who, who says that the sun revolves around the earth. Mm -hmm. And so those are the two views that are being debated. And you've got Salviati, who Galileo agrees with. The savior. Yeah. The savior, mm -hmm. right? And he's representing the Copernican view, this the, the view that we now hold, right? That the earth goes around the sun. That's right. You've got the interlocutor, as you say, Sagredo, who's kind of mediating between these guys. They both use their real names. So how come the guy who's representing Ptolemy, and really Aristotle too, they don't call him Ptolemy. They don't call him Aristotle. They don't use his real name. They use this name of this obscure commentator, Simplicio. Uh, why, do, why do they call him Simplicio? Well, I think Galileo is, was known as a brilliant scientist, but he had, he had immense flaws. He had immense uh, challenges to his character that ultimately led to his undoing. One of which is that he would do things that were precisely the impolitic thing to do, <laughs> such as take the indexes prohibition of Copernican work and the logic that goes behind the Aristotelian Earth-centered view yeah. of the cosmos. And he would put those in the, the very injunction against him. He put those in the words of the simpleton, namely the Pope, who would later become Pope, Pope Urban, yeah. uh, who would uh, preside over the, the holy office or the holy see. Yeah. You know, I always say it's like a euphemism, like the IRS is the money donation service. Yeah. You know, you just, <laughs> you just donate your money to the holy office. Yes, yeah. that's exactly what it was. It was the Inquisition. And, yeah. and, and in, true, in, in truth, Galileo had a lot to, uh, it, was, it was very much at fault when it came to the ultimate you know, culmination of that story. But but maybe before we get there, we talk about why this is such a unique work of literature. As you say, there are no equations, not textbook, yeah. or it's not like any textbook we would see nowadays. It's what we would call, you know, popular science or a trade book, meaning that it's meant for the general audience. So that's why I think readers today, in addition to the scientifically brilliant ideas and logic and philosophy, theology, the most weighty subjects, the, the ultimate issues yeah. that mankind, we just don't have as much time to think about anymore. And maybe they had more time back then, you know, there was fewer options on, on, on YouTube, etc. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Netflix, <laughs> Prager, Prager, Prager University Prager didn't exist. Right. Uh, but, uh, but nevertheless, this is so brilliantly captivating that it immediately sold out all across the continent. Galileo was world famous. Even, even in, a, in a very early age, it's almost 400-year-old book. We have, coincidentally. Yes. We have a first edition here from 1632. Correct. They, they all sold out. So yes. I'm glad it was obviously a friend of ours was able to get there in 1632, <laughs> grab right. this copy of the book. And it's funny because when the book eventually is put on the list of forbidden books, it was too late because the thing sold out within That's three right. days or something. Yeah, so so uh, I got that from a friend who got it on Amazon, you know, 400-year delivery. That's yeah. a, a little-known <laughs> aspect of Amazon that you could get. Um, so this is from a friend who's a collector of these rare books and has first edition copies of it and has uh, uh, generously loaned it to us for today. And, and this book is, is so brilliantly displayed. It has wonderful illustrations, including the cover, the frontispiece, as it's known, mm -hmm. uh, which depicts these, these wonderful characters which uh, were later used in another book after Galileo was supposedly tortured and imprisoned, which didn't really happen. Yeah. He wrote another book also called the Dialogue uh, in Dialogue Format about two different types of science, he called it. Um, and that really revolved around what we call mechanics and material science today. But the same three characters come back in this work that was published uh, only a few years before he passed away in 1642 or so. What makes this book so spectacularly uh, important and revelatory for me is that you can be a great scientist and also a great writer. And hmm. Galileo was this brilliant amalgam of all these different traits, including the human foibles, flaws, yeah. and peccadilloes that we all have. And there's a stereotype that scientists are just these geniuses, walking Wikipedia's expert trust knowledge. Trust the scientists. Trust the scientists. I trust you. I don't trust other scientists. You shouldn't trust me. So scientists are the least trusting of other scientists. <laughs> I never mean to say, oh, what'd you discover? Oh, yeah, great. Go to publish it. You know, yeah, here's right. your Stockholm Nobel Prize. Sounds good to me. <laughs> yeah. sure. Scientists have the most doubt. And that's because, as you know, the word science means knowledge. Yeah. Well, the only way that you get knowledge is by subjecting it to experimental empirical evidence. Well, what about something like as I've talked about previously, the multiverse, for which there is no evidence existing currently. It doesn't mean there never will be, right. but to what level should you trust a scientist 
that's purely speculating on theoretical findings. It could be purely theoretical. It doesn't mean it's wrong. Yeah. The theory of evolution, we have evidence for the theory of evolution, right? Um, what Galileo does so brilliantly here is he presents these two theses. Obviously, he's partial to the Copernican, the heliocentric uh, model of the, of the universe. But again, I ask, as the only homework assignment that you'll get on Prager University uh, this quarter, uh, maybe you'll get more in future quarters, is to think about it. What if you were teleported back yeah. to 1631 before this book came out? And you're trying to communicate all these wonderful discoveries of the past four, nearly 400 years. How would you prove the most simple postulates of all, that the Earth is a sphere, that the Earth rotates on its axis once per 24 hours, yeah. and that once per 365 and a quarter days, it orbits around the sun in motion? It sure as heck doesn't feel like that. And that's the subject of day one, mm -hmm. and the first day of this book. Uh, in the second day, they get into a little bit more obscure observations rather than just purely philosophical arguments on the nature of how things fall down and their things are attracted to the centers, occupied them for the most part in yeah. day one. In day three, they start talking about the composition of the earth as sort of like a magnet and it's maybe it's made of little tiny magnets all kind of congealed together. Maybe it's not. Um, what is the nature of the surface of the moon? If it's perfect, it was thought to be perfectly smooth. It doesn't look smooth, right? It, looks it smooth, has some say. imperfections in it, doesn't it? And so, uh, so Galileo had discovered, he didn't invent the telescope, but he was the first observational astronomer to look through a telescope, conceive a, a scientific hypothesis, subject it to tests, and refine his model. And that's why you shouldn't trust the scientist because hmm. at any one of those stages, he had great blunders. I mean, he was right. really brilliant. I always say, you know, he could have had a great career if he didn't make these blunders. Einstein had great blunders. There's not a serious scientist who hasn't made a serious mistake. And with Galileo, fortunately or unfortunately, those mistakes usually revolve around the politics of the day, yes. not the science. This reminds me, this uh, trusting scientist, <laughs> because it, it occurs to me when I think of all these, I think, well, Ptolemy is a scientist, yeah, right? And right. some Tycho Brahe <laughs> is right. a scientist and all these other guys, mm -hmm. and so they get things wrong. And right. there, there's a great line in the second day, and it, this is uh, Sagredo, the interlocutor, is the one, and he's recounting a story, which has, by the way, now become a cliche. And uh, he's, he's uh, talking to this guy who's a follower of Aristotle and Ptolemy, right? And... Uh, he asked this man whether he was at last satisfied and convinced that the nerves originated in the brain mm -hmm. and not in the heart. Previously, they had thought that the nerves come from the heart, but now because of sci scientific inquiry, we know, we know it's in the brain. So he asks this devotee of Aristotle, Do you, are you now satisfied? And the philosopher, after considering a while, answered, you have made me see this matter so plainly and palpably that if Aristotle's text were not contrary to it, stating clearly that the nerves originate in the heart, I should be forced to admit it to be true. <laughs> but Aristotle said it, so I don't care what I've seen. Right. I believe him over my lion eyes. <laughs> right. So I look at that and I say, almost everything that uh, Aristotle said was brilliantly wrong. In other words, huh. he would say things like a heavier object falls faster than a lighter object. Yeah. And, and Galileo would say, what if you have this heavy object, like a book, but in midair somehow, they didn't say it was a laser beam, but they say, let's say it breaks apart in midair. Now does it fall slower? Or let's say just a tiny bit of it breaks off. So now the tiny bit is lighter than the head. Of course not. It's absurd. Yeah. They could have figured that out, you know, in 300 BC when, right. when Aristotle was, was promulgated. Now he had some interesting ideas, uh, but it turns out that almost all of them were wrong. And so what Galileo... I on the say, physical side. On the, the metaphysical side, right, the I, metaphysical I give him a lot more credit. Uh, in, in terms of politics, very interesting. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but when you look at what Galileo... I always say, if you have the choice between a weather woman who's half right and half wrong or one that's always wrong. Always choose the one that's always wrong, because yeah. you'll just do the opposite. <laughs> right. That Galileo used to great effect. Huh. The ultimate conclusion of this book in day four turns out to be wrong. And it actually is only thanks to the Pope hmm. who enjoined him to not publish uh, the book with his original title, which was The Spectacular, which would do so well in A-B testing. The original title that Galileo wanted was On the Flux and Reflux of the Earth's Tides. Wow. Go, where do I get it? Run get away. Me Amazon. It's yeah. blank book, but yeah. no, no, but it wouldn't <laughs> yeah. be a blank book. Uh, but actually, it's a cha it's a subject of the fourth chapter about the uh, fourth day, which Galileo felt was the dispositive conclusion that was inescapable. That because the Earth has oceans on it, and because it spins on its axis, as he had proved in the preceding yeah. days, as it rotates around the sun, just as this vodka, no, just as this <laughs> water sloshes about in this bottle as I rotate and revolve it, so yeah. too are tides on the Earth's surface caused by such a phenomenon. Right. In fact, we now know that it is indeed the moon 
that causes the Earth's tide. The moon has a gravitational force field that acts on the Earth and tugs on the oceans a little bit more and a little bit less on the different sides of it four times a day. Yeah. Now, Galileo had the data. Conclusion was absolutely wrong because it was, he fell victim to what we call confirmation bias. Hmm. Scientists are very subject to it. I've personally been subject to it. When you want to prove something so badly, maybe it's to get tenure, maybe it's yeah. to get a prize or to get attention, or maybe because your theory is so beautiful it can't be wrong, as Einstein used to say, yeah. uh, that you sort of fall in love with it and you discard contrary evidence. Galileo fell victim to it, and ultimately the Pope did him a real favor by forcing him to change it to this much more interesting and provocative title. This is very funny, that because people totally, it's not that they even misunderstand the Galileo incident. It's not that they're ignorant of it. It's that they know so much that isn't so. Yes. They know things that just didn't happen. So, you know, in the traditional way the story is told, Galileo, this brilliant guy, is totally oppressed by the Inquisition and by the Catholic Church. And these tortured. awful ladies tortured. He's thrown in a prison cell. It's, you know, it, it's the worst anti-intellectual, anti-scholarship thing that's ever happened. And that isn't quite true. First of all, the Pope actually helps him yeah. because he gets that, that theory wrong. But the Pope had been uh, sort of pals with Galileo, right? Yeah. Pope Urban VIII. And then how does Galileo repay him? He names his character Simpleton in the book. <laughs> and, and there's another great line from the era, from another pal of Galileo's, Cardinal Baronius, yeah. who they, they were very, uh, I won't say they were tolerant of these sort of scientific inquiries, but they weren't, you know, burning these, uh, Galileo at the stake or anything like that. And Baronius famously said, that uh, the Bible teaches us how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. It does not, it does not form these rock solid canonical scientific conclusions about the world. And so you can be open to inquiry. You say that Galileo runs afoul of the Inquisition because he was impolitic. Yeah. I think, I think he had an agenda and I think his uh, scientific agenda sort of superseded some of the reason in his interpersonal skills. So there's a joke, how do you know a scientist is outgoing? He looks at your shoes when he talks to you instead of his own. So <laughs> Galileo had great flaws. Uh, he was uh, sort of boorish in his personal life. He wasn't the greatest father. He had yeah. two daughters and a son out of wedlock. But he was a religious man. He did believe and he considered himself a good Catholic, which is why the ultimate, you know, in, uh, the ultimate verdict as, as you might say, yeah. uh, was that uh, he was guilty of suspicion of heresy, not heresy itself, for which he would have been tortured. Yeah. Uh, it was sort of done under threat of torture, and you can argue if that's the same. He certainly was never tortured in the classic sense. He, he did have to bow down and, and kiss the Pope's rings, etc. Um, but, yeah, but given the how... We all did in those days, <laughs> right? right. Yeah, yeah. Sort of... My students... Are, no, yeah. God forbid. <laughs> but, uh, but, but the point of Galileo being... There are actually books called, you know, Galileo Goes to Jail and Other Myths. You know, yeah. so there's this narrative that was established after this book because of that incident, the Galileo Affair, uh, as it's known, that really chose to pit this as the first battle between science and God. Yeah. And that Galileo, you know, they, they imprisoned reason. On, there's another book called On Trial for Reason, suggesting that, you know, merely because of his ideas. Now, I ask you, um, there are comparisons made, you know, et cetera, but what if I came up with some idea that we're about to collide with an enormous black hole and you're, the pr you're President Knowles and uh, you're the most you know, powerful ruler on earth, um, it's it's a question. If something could undermine and cause pure panic and uh, and and debate and and just cause maybe perhaps there's nothing good that can come of it, and you know that. Yeah. Do you have an obligation to reveal that? If indeed you thought it's compatible with somewhat of the Catholic Church's worldview to to go against what Galileo was saying. Right. So I think there are a lot of myths about scientists, and there's certainly a lot of myths about. Galileo and how he was treated ultimately. Okay, but at the very least, yeah. you, uh, you've you've convinced me. You you you've uh, <laughs> affirmed for me right. what I what I had uh, always known. The confirmation in my, bias. It's confirmation <laughs> bias because I I always like uh, digging in at Galileo. I say <laughs> they didn't throw him in jail for being a scientist. They threw him in jail for being a jerk. But you say okay, he he doesn't get tortured. That's a total myth. But he does go to jail, surely. So he was uh, he was sentenced to house imprisonment, and I was uh, lucky enough to host a conference in his very prison, namely his final villa, yeah. Villa de Galolio, uh, outside of Florence, and it's a small town called Arcetri, which is less than a couple of kilometers for the from the convent where his daughters were serving as nuns. So they served as nuns uh, within within walking distance of their father, and they would communicate with him. Uh, he d continued to write books and 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 see visitors. 
And he was by no means, I always say, you know, Bernie Madoff would trade jail cells in a second. Yeah. It's sumptuous. Uh, not to say that, you know, he might not have wanted to travel elsewhere. He was also very old. He was infirm. He had kidney problems, probably. Uh, and ultimately, he lived about another nine years or so after the uh, after the sentence was handed down. But it was by no means a torturous existence. He actually, as I say, wrote books, conducted final observations, and some of them went into what they consider his most important book, a second dialogue hmm. between these three wonderful characters called the Discorsi, the dis discussion on two chief sciences. You, you've assigned me now more homework. That's that right. I have to. I have to. It's it's so interesting to me that when we talk about science, it, it has become such a politicized term, it's now capital S, with yeah. a trademark sign over the E, <laughs> and you hear these terms like science denier, we're the party of science, we're the, we own mm -hmm. science. And so often those stories are just complete legends, fabrications, going back probably most notably to Galileo, where, where I would suspect that the, the people who, uh, who are always inveighing against the science deniers they don't know the real story of what happened to Galileo. Yeah, it provides a very convenient, and in this book, Galileo uh, goes to jail and other myths about science, goes through this, this you know, very complicated interplay between the church and science and uh, puts to lie some of the myths about these great characters, Giordano Bruno, who is another uh, character very hold, held very closely to people for being burned at the stake, for postulating that stars were actually other solar systems were planets where people could live, for example. Um, but I think, you know, one thing to give to, to give a little bit of upbraiding to the Catholic Church. So Galileo was never pardoned. And yeah. actually for me, that caused me, I was an altar boy in the Catholic Church right. yeah. at age 12. And I did uh, want to eventually go all the way, uh, which would be becoming a priest. And at that time, I got my first small telescope, not unlike one that's back there. And uh, the one homework assignment I would love to give people here, even in the middle of L.A., you can see the exact same craters on the surface of the moon that mm. Galileo saw. You can see the glorious rings of Saturn. You can see the moons of Jupiter and other heavenly uh, uh, objects that inspired Galileo yeah. towards a love, towards an affirmation that there was a higher power, which is actually the ultimate conclusion of the book. If right. I may Please. read one or, one or two passages that really speak so loudly and speak to his uh, poetic use of language. He was not just a dry science professor like Isaac Newton was yeah. um, or unreadable as Copernicus might be. This is the book that really set into motion the future Hawkings and et cetera of the world, the future Keatings of the world. So he says, I do not presume to be able to adduce all the proper and sufficient causes of those effects which are new to me and which consequently I have had no chance to think about. What I'm about to say, I propose merely as a key to open portals to a road never before trodden by anyone in a firm hope that minds more acute than mine will broaden this road and penetrate further along it than I have done in my first revealing of it. He's giving an assignment. He's enjoining people to take up the, yeah. the path that he has started on, but continue it, meaning he's not the last word. And in fact, the last word goes to the Pope. The last word in the book goes to none other than Simplicio, the simpleton. Not too often you give the simpleton the last word, but you'll <laughs> indulge me in doing just the same. So uh, before they break for drinks, uh, he, uh, there's a long discourse by, by uh, Segredo, um, and, and, and Simplicio said, you need not make any excuses, they are superfluous, and especially to me, being accustomed to public debates, have heard disputants countless times, not merely go angry and excited at each other, but even break out into insulting speech, and s sometimes come very close to blows. But he basically said, I know if I had asked that God in his infinite power and wisdom could have conferred upon the watery element, the tides, its observer superkening motion by other means of its containing vessels, both of which would reply that he, capital H, could have, and that he, capital H, would have known how to do this in many ways which are undeniable to our minds. He's giving the last word to the church. Right. And to probe, and, and I think it was consonant with his viewpoint. I don't think he really, he was an atheist. Well, By no means, there's no, no evidence for that you, whatsoever. You know, there's another, there's another great line. God yeah. comes up a lot yes. more here than in most science most, books. <laughs> yeah. And it's not, it's not merely, I think, as a sort of gloss for his right. true atheistic views. Insurance policy. Right? Yeah, you, you know, you've got to give him more credit than that. He's a much deeper thinker than that. And, and he writes, this is on day three. He says, I say that it is brash for our feebleness to attempt to judge the reason for God's actions and to call everything in the universe vain and superfluous, which does not serve us. Because that's, that's really a central issue here, right? Man is not sitting at the very center of the universe if Galileo's right. right. And, so, and, and why on earth would, would these heavenly bodies not be perfectly smooth? Why would, they not, why would they have these imperfections? It has no purpose. It has no ser service to mankind. And 
so he says, well, I think it's, look, it's a little brash. This is, this is in the mouth of Salviati, yes. the, the guy who's representing Galileo. He says, I think it would be brash to just say, oh yeah, sorry, everything that doesn't serve us is vain and pointless, and God had no reason to do that. And then Segreda, the interlocutor, complicates this a little. He says, say rather, and I think you will be speaking more accurately, which we do not know to serve us. I believe that one of the greatest pieces of arrogance, or rather madness, that can be thought of is to say, since I do not know how Jupiter or Saturn is of service to me, they are superfluous and even do not exist. Yes, that's brilliant. Now that is a beautiful complication here, and, and in a way exposes the arrogance of uh, even the people that Galileo probably would side with and who now think they side with Galileo. And you see echoes of this in the modern, you know, militant atheist movements, yep. the Lawrence Krauss's, etc., that suggest, well, look at the Hubble Deep Field, in, which is an image made by the Hubble Space Telescope staring for weeks at a time at a tiny blank spot in the cosmo cosmic wallpaper and discovering that every, every place you look, there's a galaxy. And they'll say, well, that proves there's no God because there's all this wasted space. There's all these wasted galaxies of which, you know, we know nothing about, we can never contact, etc. But just the same way, who would look at Jupiter and say, oh, well, those moons of Jupiter, or the telescope itself, oh, it's only good for looking up the moons of Jupiter. Yeah. That would be so limiting the power of the telescope, all the more so to limit the power of God. And I'm not here to advocate on behalf or, or not, I don't think it's as simple as saying, well, Galileo believed in God, or Einstein might have believed in God, so I'm gonna believe in God. We know Newton certainly believed in God. Certainly did, yeah. But it was interesting that people use this, this as a cudgel to really go after the biblical authorities and to give them you know, some ammunition. It's true that they never formally issued a pardon right. to Galileo, which, right. which affected me greatly as a kid, yeah. but now I'm an adult. And now yeah. you have to look with a little bit more wisdom, which is not what the word science means. Science right. means knowledge. Well, even, even this issue, the, even the question of, of the Vatican apologizing to Galileo, only really even became a big one in the mid to late 20th century, yeah, right? And then they said, okay, maybe, maybe we were a little harsh on the guy. And did you know that the Vatican operates a series of telescopes right. uh, throughout, <laughs> around right. the world? Why would they do that? I mean, a lot of it is, you know, as the psalmist says, the heavens declare the handiwork of God. Right. And wisdom begins with the fear of God. Now, yeah. again, I'm not advocating on behalf of any religion or even the existence of God. I'm just saying it's a question that Galileo wrestled with. Yeah. And it behooves us to wrestle alongside of him. Right. And, and not to make a caricature out of him, not to read, the, read him as just a silly cartoon that, is, that actually has nothing to do with his life, the way he's normally presented. You actually have to dig into the book. But it occurs to me, uh, you have put me at a disadvantage here because Simplicio has to end this discussion even. Uh, Brian, break for drinks on the canal. That's right. As, now we will break, do. much like these characters, we will break for drinks on the canal. Brian, thank you so much for being here. Another book you ought to read is Losing the Nobel Prize. You can do that right after you finish the dialogue concerning the two chief world systems. In the meantime, we'll see you next time. I'm Michael Knowles, and this is The Book Club at PragerU. Thank you so much for watching this episode of The Book Club on PragerU. PragerU is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, so we rely on donations from viewers like you to keep this content on the air. Please consider making a tax-deductible contribution today to help keep this content coming. Thank you very much.